Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good to see you guys. Good to be here together. Um, ready to hear a message for Jesus and, and sing his praises tonight. Um, Chris, you like to pray some please? Jesus, I'm just so grateful to be here and to hear what you have to say to equip us and send us to to be your representatives here. Um, you're always here, I'm so um, I just I just um, pray that we all have a um, heavenly perspective, Jesus, and that we are all in a place of surrender to you. Um, that that our hearts are softened so so they can be molded and shaped by you because you are the potter that we just took clay. And um, I just I just um, thank you for guiding and and, and correcting us and, and loving us um, even though we don't deserve it. Um, I just pray as as we sing these songs that, that we really just know like the gravity of what you've done on the cross for us and and what you continue to do for us, even if you never did anything but, but die on the cross, and that would be so much, Jesus. But you, you continue to do everything, and, and uh, I just pray that we're all in, in a place of of, of, uh, of holy fear and awe of you, Jesus, and, and who you are. I love you, Nancy. Amen. First song we're going to do is Does He Lives? Um, I'm going to read out of John 14, 19 through 21. John 14, what? 19 through 21. And it says, Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Since I live, you will also live. When I am raised to life again, you will know that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them, and I will love them, and reveal myself to each of them.
How's everybody doing? Good. Hey. Spirits moving in this place? Yeah. That's for sure. I see lots of happy faces. The Spirit of the Lord is here. Okay, so uh, I'm going to do communion. Um, it's all about, you know, remembering what the Lord did on the cross, you know, and the first thing that I could, uh, you know, uh, that came on my heart was, you know, just his love for us. The cross just completely shows his unfailing love. Um, and I just all want us to take a second here, close our eyes. And I, as we were just singing that song, um, I was dead in the grave. I was covered in sin and shame. I heard mercy call my name. He rolled the stone away. I know there was all a time when we were all dead in the grave. And uh, I just all want us to close our eyes and re remember when we were at our worst for a second. Yeah, Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, death had its grip on us at one point in time, Father, and uh, then you used someone, uh, you made a way, Lord, for us to hear the gospel. Uh, you pointed us to the cross. Uh, what you did for us. Father was amazing. Uh, we love you so much for that. And we know uh, we shall never forget that, Lord. Uh, when we were at our worst, when we were in the grave, Father, um, you pulled us out of the grave right along with you, Lord. And I just want to thank you for that. Because now uh, no shadow of shame can darken our faces, Lord, uh, because of what you did on the cross. Jesus, we can now uh, we can now live in joy and peace, Father. So we love you so much. And it's in your precious name I pray. Amen. Um. So one thing about Jesus, and you know, he never forgets. He never forgets his wit. He he's wisdom himself. In our finite minds, we need to be reminded all the time of what Jesus did on the cross and why. You know. And I believe that's why, you know, um, when when Jesus appeared to Peter uh, and his disciples for the third time, you know, Jesus kept asking Peter, hey, do you love me? Do you love me? Peter, do you love me? You know, and uh, a lot of times here, especially I really recover, we just people that just forget, you know, sometimes, you know, and uh, we need to repeat things to each other. <clears throat> So we won't forget. And, uh, you know, so uh, we remember Jesus, you know, so we can remember to obey. And we remember to obey him because we love him. And when we love him, we're in close communion with him. And that's what communion is all about. Uh, being remembering the, uh, what Jesus Christ did on the cross. He rose from the grave so we can come out of the grave with him. And, and man, uh, he just uh, wants to remind us here today, for those that haven't been in a place of brokenness or, or whatnot, you know, um, you know, he's, he's, He's here to just, he, he's here to share the good news today. There's going to be a word, um, words of life that are going to be shared today. And uh, if we listen, we'll live, you know. And um, just going to read uh, out of Deuteronomy 10, 12, a call to love and obedience. And now Israel what does the Lord your God require of you? He requires only that you fear the Lord your God and live in a way that pleases him. 
and love him and serve him with all your heart and soul. And you must always obey the Lord's commands and decrees that I'm giving you today for your own good. And to go to the communion, um, you know, Jesus said, Luke 22, 15, I've been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. When he took a cup of wine, he gave thanks to God for it. Then he said, take this and share it amongst, amongst yourselves. For I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's take this communion as a family. And remember what the Lord has done for us. Next song we're gonna do is breakthrough. Um, and I was when I was going through the songs earlier, um, I thought that I had a thought that if we want a breakthrough, it's not gonna happen unless we have faith that the breakthrough is gonna happen. Um, so I'm gonna read out of Hebrews 11, and I'm gonna jump around a few verses, um, starting in verse one. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Verse 6. And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Verse 13. All these people died still believing God had pro what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth. Uh, verse 39 and 40. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith, yet none of them received all that God had promised. For God had something better in mind for us, so that they would not reach perfection without us.
Assyria and Egypt will return to Jerusalem to worship the Lord on his holy mountain. Whisper in darkness. 
guys good evening. good evening so man i'm super excited uh because on the wednesdays that i give the devotional slash message because sometimes it's a devotional sometimes it's a message um i'm gonna take us through the book of joshua um as i said before like there's gonna be some <laughs> sections in here where I'm just going to do a short message, just like we would, and we're going to, it's going to be like a devotional, and then there's going to be other times that I know the Holy Spirit's going to prompt me to give a message. Message. Um, and so, I like my, I like the freedom to be able to talk about whatever Jesus puts on my heart, right? Like, you know, because we're going through the book of Mark on Sundays. And so I always enjoy Wednesdays because I have the freedom to talk about the things that Jesus puts on my heart. You guys have heard that a lot lately, right? There's been some really good messages that have developed um, because of the meetings and different things that I've been sitting in. And I talk about that. And that's because Jesus, I'm sitting there in the moment of a meeting or whatever. And, and Jesus is like, you got to get a message about what, what's being said here. You know, and so I really love that freedom 
But as I spend time in prayer with Jesus, he wants to mold and shape us as we go through the book of Joshua. Like, he really wants to mold and shape us. And during my prayer time there, man, uh, with Jesus, he wanted, <laughs> I've been talking to you guys a lot about um, our mission here in Akron and why we're even in Akron. And this is even going to mold and shape us as we think about that and as we think about uh, the book of Joshua. And, and so uh, I think it's going to be it's going to be very beneficial for us, especially core people that are here that are going to be here uh, long enough to make it all the way through the book, because it's going to take a while. It's going to take a while to make it through uh, the book of Joshua, but I believe it's going to mold and shape us as the church. And, and, and as I say, the church people who are really a part of the body of Christ, who are really here and are sold out uh, for Jesus and for others, will plant seeds along the way, right? Um, and so I've been praying for us. And... Um, you know, that, that time has looked like uh, praying that as we go through the book of Joshua, that we would see the crazy, amazing things that Jesus wants to do with us as a church. And that we would have this divine uh, expectation in who Jesus is, and we would engage. Divine expectation, engage, and engagement in the awesome things that Jesus is going to be doing with us as we move through the book of Joshua and then how this, the book of Joshua, we should sit here and we should read this and we should give messages on this on Wednesday and, and devos and then we should clearly be able to look up into our current situation and where Jesus has us here in this area in Akron and go, are we doing this? Are we fighting back darkness? Are we taking territory for the king? Are people being saved? And so I think it's going to be really good for us. And um, I think a lot of times, guys, that, you know, I get up here and, and you guys just think like, hey, Lego's saying some really good stuff and it just came from Lego. And, and that's just not true, right? Like, I have the Holy Spirit that lives in me, but I have people in my life, right? I have good people and good counsel in my life that have passed wholesome teaching down to me. And so when I'm standing in front of you guys and I'm saying things, I'm not just saying things. I'm saying things that are wholesome that have been passed down to me, right? A lot of times before I even get up to give a message with you guys, one of the first things I do is I text Ken and I go, hey, this is what I'm talking about, or this is the passage, or whatever. What do you think and what do you see? You know, and he'll talk to me about, hey, this is what I see, and this is what I think, and this is what the Holy Spirit's leading me to say. You know, and so there's a lot of times that I stand in front of you that sure, Jesus through his word uh, enlightens me, but there's also where Jesus clearly passes wholesome teaching down. And that's what it even says in 2 Timothy 2, right? It says in 2 Timothy 2, 2, uh, You have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to us, to other trustworthy people, who will be able to pass them on to others. And so this time here, guys, should be a time that molds and shapes us as the church. But what we do here, and what, we, and what is said here, through the power of the Holy Spirit, should be passed down, and passed down, and passed down. It's no different when we say disciples that make disciples. We want disciples who make disciples, and, and you were disciple. how do you go disciple somebody else? The same way you were discipled, right? When you think about it, it's like, well, this is what they did with me. And so I'm now I'm going to turn around and I'm going to go do that. And it's no different really with the messages. And so tonight we are going to go through the first five verses of Joshua chapter 1. 
And this is what it says. It says, after the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land I am giving them. I promised you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set foot, you will be on land I have given you. From the naive wilderness to the south, to the Lebanon Mountains in the north, from the Euphrates River in the east, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west, including all the land of the Hittites. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live, for I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. And so the title of this message is, We Follow. Because... As we go through the book of Joshua, what I've so far discovered during my time with Jesus is he's taken me pretty deep in, in the book of Joshua, right? But what I want us to do is grasp on to the simplicity of what's happening in Joshua. Because if we can, if we can really grasp on to the simplicity of what's <laughs> taking place here, man, and, 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 and we can conform ourselves to Jesus and to his word. And we can, we can look at it and then look at our situation and, and, and go, is it applying? In the simplest things, we can make the biggest impact. I mean, Jesus takes 11 guys, right? Not, not including Judas, who ends up betraying him. And he, and he does what? Each one of you that sit here that has new life is a direct result of those 11. Yeah. yeah. And so think about that and think about the impact that we can make if we cling to the simplicity of what Jesus is trying to say to us as we move through the book of Joshua. And so the message again, once again, the name is we follow. We follow. And so um, it says Moses, or, or Moses being the Lord's servant, you know, because that's what it says, Moses, uh, the Lord's servant. Uh, it, this, should, this part should really uh, kind of stand out to us here tonight um, in the sense of Moses, man, he had a real relationship with Jesus. Like Moses had a real relationship with Jesus and I want you to listen to what it says in Numbers chapter 12, verse 3. Okay? Numbers chapter 12, verse 3. It says, um, Now Moses was very humble, more humble than any other person on earth. Okay? So we're just going to start there. Moses has a real relationship with Jesus. And Scripture clearly says he was the most humble person on earth and if you back up to verse 1 because now I'm going to read the whole thing of what's going on here it says while they were at Hazroth Miriam and Aaron criticized Moses because he had married a Cushite woman they said has the Lord spoken only through Moses hasn't he spoken through us too but the Lord heard them now Moses was very humble, more humble than any other person on earth. So immediately the Lord called to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam and said, Go out to the tabernacle, all three of you. So the three of them went to the tabernacle. Then the Lord descended in the pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tabernacle. Aaron and Miriam he called, and they stepped forward. And the Lord said to them, Now listen to what I say. If there were prophets among you, I, the Lord, would reveal myself in visions. I would speak to them in dreams, but not with my servant Moses. Of all my house, he is the one I trust. I speak to him face to face, clearly, and not in riddles. He sees the Lord as he is. So why were you not afraid to criticize my servant Moses? And so look, hands down. 
hands down. It's safe to say Moses has a real relationship with Jesus. It's safe to say Moses has a real uh, relationship with Jesus, actually like no one else had, even Joshua. Even Joshua, right? Uh, even Joshua, he would actually go into the tent along with Moses and be in God's presence. But it actually only says the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one who speaks to a friend. And so it speaks to the real relationship that Moses had with Jesus. And not everybody had that. Not everybody had that. Um, see, in Exodus, we get this picture of what it was like for everyone else, okay? You get this picture of what it's like for everyone else. And in Exodus uh, 33, uh, verse 8, it says, Whenever Moses went out to the tent of meeting, all the people would get up and stand in the entrance of their own tents. They would all watch Moses until he disappeared inside. As he went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and hover, and hover at its entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. When the people saw the cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, they would stand and bow down in front of their own tents. Inside the tent of meeting, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one who speaks to a friend. Afterwards, Moses would return to the camp, but the young man who assisted him, Joshua, son of Nun, would remain behind in the tent of meeting. And so everyone else, right, would, would, have to, would, would have to watch from afar as Moses would go and spend time with Jesus face to face, man. They didn't have the same relationship Moses had. I want you to imagine for a second watching Moses walk by you and go into the tent of meeting, knowing he was going to be with Jesus in Jesus' presence and not being able to experience that. And not being able to experience that because that's exactly what was taking place, right? But Jesus. This is our but Jesus moment because there's good news. Right? There is good news because everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus in the film and the fulfillment of his promises, right? And now because of Jesus and, and, um, and the cross, you can go into the tent of meetings. Actually, better yet, you are the tent, and Jesus lives in you. That's right. Praise Jesus for that, right? And so listen uh, to what it says uh, here in Hebrews. It says, and so, and so these guys, let me back up for a second so I don't get ahead of myself. So, so imagine, imagine being the Israelites. Imagine Moses walking by, you know, because they have their tents. Boom, 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 boom. You know, and on each side, and here comes Moses, you know, and he's just strutting along, and you're at your tent, and you know he's going to the tent of meetings, and you know he's going to be with Jesus, man, and you're just sitting there, and, 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 and you don't have that relationship, and what do you think that would really be like, right? But what Jesus, but Jesus has made a way because of the cross, and in Hebrews 10, verse 19, it says, and so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place, right? I'm going to stop there for just a second. I'm going to shift gears over to um, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And I'll start in verse 12. It says, since this new way gives us such confidence, we, we can be very bold. We are not like Moses who put a veil over his face so the people of Israel would not see the glory, even though it was destined to fade away. But the people's minds were hardened to this. 
day, and whenever the old covenant is being read, the same veil covers their minds, so they cannot understand the truth. And this veil can be removed only, listen, this veil can only be removed by believing in Christ. Yes, even today, when they read Moses' writing, their hearts are covered with that veil, and they do not understand. And then it goes right into 16. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. And we're not, we're not standing at the tent watching Moses cruise by. Like, that's not our testimony. Like, Jesus has made a way for the veil to be removed through turning to Him to see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom and this is the this is a the, this is what it's talking about in verse 20 by his death jesus opened a, a new light a uh, new and life giving way through the curtain into the most holy place and since we have a great high priest who rules over god's house let us go right into the presence of god with sincere hearts fully trusting him for our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with christ's blood to make us clean and our bodies have been washed with pure water and honestly man i wish i had more time like what it what would have been really great to do was go and do a huge overview of the first five books uh before you get to joshua and what's led up to this point um but i think we're pointing out the big things here and, and what's in kind of what's going on and, and even leading up to this and and, and so this is um, Moses, the Lord's servant, that's who he is. Um, that's kind of some background um, of the relationship that he had with Jesus. Um, and then he goes on to say the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, Moses, my servant, is dead. And so even though Moses has this crazy close relationship with Jesus, right? Even though he has this crazy close relationship to Jesus, Jesus doesn't make a big deal out of Moses. You don't see that. He doesn't make a, a crazy big deal out of Moses. He literally says, Moses is dead and your time has come. <laughs> he doesn't make this huge deal uh, out of Moses. And, 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 and that points to what we always teach here. Um, God wants you. Jesus wants you. Does he need you? He, he doesn't need you. And everything points to him, right? And so he doesn't make a, a, this big deal out of, out of Moses. And he literally says now to, to Joshua, your time has come to lead. Um, and, and, this, and Moses being the most humble man, I want to make this clear, guys, on earth. That's the way he would have wanted it to be. That is the way Moses would have wanted it to be. Moses always took the humble position of a slave. Moses always took the humble position of a slave. Uh, he never wanted attention, and he always wanted Jesus to get the glory, right? He always wanted Jesus to get the glory. And then you're going to hear me go back from the Old Testament to the New Testament because, as I've said, uh, you know, the Old Testament always points to Jesus and the fulfillment of Jesus. And then uh, later on in Luke 17, Jesus in his own words says um, in verse 7, when a servant comes in from plowing or taking care of sheep, does his master say, come in and eat, or, come in and eat with me? No, he says, prepare my meal Put on your apron and serve me while I eat. Then you can eat later. And does the master thank the servant for doing what he was told to do? Of course not. In the same way, when you obey me, you should say we are unworthy servants who have simply done our duty. We are simply unworthy servants who have done our duty. That's us. 
We are unworthy servants, no different than Moses, and our lives should be for Jesus. <clears throat> and so picking back up here in Joshua, it says, Therefore the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River in the land I am giving them. And so obviously Josh being Moses is a, Joshua being Moses' assistant has been being molded and shaped to pick up where Moses ends, right? Like he's clearly been molded and shaped. And, and, and I'm going to go back to Joshua literally spent time in the presence of, 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 of Jesus too. He was in the tent with Moses and them, even though it doesn't say that, 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 that the Lord spoke to him face to face like he spoke uh, to Moses, which clearly shows you they had a different kind of relationship. But also at the same time, without no doubt, Joshua was being molded and shaped for, for what come next as, as being Moses' assistant. And, and as things, as I started off and I talked about 2 Timothy chapter 2, being taught these things and then passing these things down, you know, uh, and disciples that make disciples, that's what we see with Joshua and being Moses' assistant and, and him even not having the same relationship that, that Moses had, right? But clearly, the Lord's going to call him uh, to do some mighty work. And so, I want to remind you guys that Moses only gets to look across and see the promised land. Okay, Moses only gets to look across and see the promised land, and it's directly tied to his disobedience to Jesus. And so the one who spoke to Jesus face to face, and, 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 and the Lord spoke to him as a friend, like he was disobedient at one point to the Lord, and because of his disobedience, he only gets to look across and see the promised land. He doesn't actually get to go there. Okay? And so, listen to what it says in Deuteronomy 32, uh, verse 48 and 52. It says, That same day the Lord said to Moses, Go to Moab, to the mountains east of the river, and climb Mount Nebo, which is across from Jericho. Look out across the land of Canaan, the land I am giving to the people of Israel as their own special possession. Then you will die there on the mountain. You will join your ancestors just as Aaron, your brother, died on Mount Hor, and joined his ancestors. For both of you betrayed me with the Israelites at the water of Mer Merbah and Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin. You failed to demonstrate my holiness to the people of Israel there, so you will see the land from a distance, but you may not enter the land I'm giving to the people of Israel. And so I bring this up, guys, because being obedient is a big part of the book of Joshua. As we move through the book of Joshua, obedience is going to be key here, and, 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 and it's what the Israelites have been really bad about. The, real, the Israelites have been really bad uh, about this, and, and they've wandered in the wilderness for 40 years up to this point, and it's directly tied to their disobedience. Okay, Them wandering the wilderness for 40 years, what should have took like 11 days or something to get to, has literally took them 40 years because of their disobedience. And so obedience is a huge part of the book of Joshua and, and what we're about to be talking about. Um, but the time has come. That time has come. They've, they've made it to the Jordan, right? They're, they're there. And the, this, the time has come, and Jesus has called Joshua to lead the people finally over. Okay? It, it's finally come. He's, he's called Joshua to lead the people over. And, and so listen to what it says starting in verse 3 of Joshua. I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set foot, you will be on land I have given you, from the naive wilderness to the south, to the Lebanon mountains in the north, 
from the Euphrates rivers in the east to the Mediterranean Sea in the west, including all the land of the Hittites. Jesus, um, Jesus gives Joshua the same promise. He gave him the same promise he gave Moses, right? And this should really stand out to us. Uh, Jesus says, wherever you set foot, you will be on land I am giving you, right? And that's why this message is even titled, We Follow. Okay, this is why this message is, in is titled, We Follow, um, and because he says, where uh, you will be on land I am giving you. What it doesn't say, and hear me guys when I say this, um, is, is I'll be with you wherever you want to go. That's not what this says. That's not what this says, and I want to be clear about that. It says, no, wherever you step, Jesus says, I will give you. And why do you think that's, that is? Because he's already stepped there. Because he's already stepped there. To follow Jesus is to go where he is. To follow Jesus is to go where he is, not where you want to go, but where he is. And um, Ken uses this illustration of when Jack was little. Um, Jack is his oldest son, and when Jack was little and, the, and it would snow like really heavy, uh, Ken would take him out there, but first, Ken would go like tromping through the snow, you know, and then uh, Jack would follow behind him, and he would like get into those, into those spots, right? He would get into those spots that Ken had already walked in. He was following in his steps, right? And uh, that is exactly what Jesus is saying here. If you follow me, right, wherever you step is yours. And it's like, because Jesus has already stepped there and it's his. Because he's already stepped there and it's his. On top of that, guys, they are walking through enemy territory. The reason they didn't cross the Jordan was because there was all these big scary people over there that they didn't want to go fight. And, and the Lord's like, this is the land I'm giving you, and that's where you need to go. But they're looking at it from a physical thing, and they're going, I don't know. There's big people over there, and they, they, want to, they don't want us to come over. And so they are walking through enemy territory. So being tied to obedience to Jesus, stepping where he has already been, and bringing the presence of Jesus to the darkness is a big part of what we're talking about. And it's a big part of what we're doing here in Akron. It's a big part of what we're doing in Akron, right? And so by walking the light and giving the light, and remember this, all points to Jesus and his promises. <laughs> and we can look to the, New, to the New Testament for this and listen to what Jesus says in John 8, 12. Because then Jesus shows up again, and in John 8, 12, he says, Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk into darkness. You won't have to walk in darkness. Because you will have the light that leads to life. Everything outside of this, outside of Jesus, is what? Dark. It's all darkness. It's all darkness. Okay? And so we are to bring that light in the presence of Jesus to this dark world. And, and let's just back up for a world and talk about the city of Akron. Because that's why we've touched down here. That is why we've touched down here. To make an impact right here. But in order to make that impact, we have to listen and be following Jesus and going where he is going. Our obedience is going to be directly tied to fighting back darkness right here now. Hands down. Plain and simple, guys. Verse 5 of Joshua says, 
No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live, for I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. It says no one will be able to stand against you. Why? Why? Because Jesus is with us. No one will be able to stand against us because Jesus is with us. Why? Because we are following him. We are where he is, right? That's why no one can stand against us if we are where Jesus is because you can't stand against Jesus. You can't stand against against Jesus, right? And so, it's easy to say that, but now let's look up for a second and go, how does that apply? And I'll tell you how it applies. We bought a couple houses in Mansfield, okay? And one of them is, is it's like a commercial uh, property, and so we can do whatever we want with that one. But but the men's house was residential, and, and so... They have this, this thing about not having multi-family uh, housing in Mansfield. And so it's one family per house. That's not why we bought the house. We bought the house to throw like as many people as we could get in it. And so the next thing you know, it looked like we were going to be in a fight with the city of Mansfield. And... Um, their, their board, whatever it is, I don't, community board, uh, planning, commission. planning commission, there you go, their planning commission, right? And they're like, hey, you guys can't do this. And so we didn't know what it was going to, we didn't know what it was going to look like, you know, and, and, and <clears throat> I don't want to make this story longer than it has to be. They went, they talked to the, to the committee board or whatever, and it looked like they were going to shoot it down. They said, hey, come back 30 days from now. we got to look over some things. Um, and in the meantime, um, you know, we started to pray, and everybody was praying. But really, um, I think Ken and the guys in Mansfield, Dale and Steve, uh, you guys aren't familiar with them. They're from the Mac. They got together uh, the, the day of the planning commission. Okay, and they met up early and they were just, they were just, they, it started with Dale and Ken just being in the sanctuary and they're just <clears throat> praying and Steve was supposed to be there, but he, but he was running behind, Ken told me. And so they just start to pray organically. Steve shows up. The next thing you know, he's at the piano. He's like, he's like playing some music as they're praying and then they all start to pray. And the spirit just starts to move in a mighty way. And they get up from that. And Kim was supposed to meet uh, with a guy that we know who is a, he's a lawyer for this exact reason. And he was going to go with Kim to the, to the planning commission meeting. And so they're sitting there having lunch waiting, right? And all of a sudden they get a call before they even get to the meeting. And Mansfield, they, they, they were like, hey, look, we're sorry. We're sorry, you know what, go ahead, use that house, do whatever you want with it, it's yours. The only thing you got to do is you got to come up with like a, you know, an escape plan. You got a bunch of people living in a house, you need a, you need a way out, you know, which makes 100% sense. But listen, from where we started and where we ended up, can only be explained by Jesus. Amen. Can only be explained by Jesus. And so, and so no one can stand against us when we follow Jesus. And what Jesus has already taken is his, and we just have to step into it when he steps into it. No one can stand against Jesus. <laughs> and Jesus clearly says in John uh, chapter 12, verse 26, if you want to follow me, you got to be where I am, right? He says, anyone who wants to serve me must follow me because my servants must be where I am and the Father will honor anyone who serves me. So listen, as I've been saying, guys, we can directly relate this to us here in Akron. 
and fighting back darkness here in Athens and taking in enemy territory and people experiencing the promise. And the promise is, right? And all of this, guys, all of this is going to be tied to our obedience to Jesus. It's going to be tied to our obedience to Jesus. If we're going to fight back darkness, if we're going to take on anything, it's not going to be us that does it. It's going to be Jesus, and we got to be tethered to Jesus, walking in obedience to Jesus. We follow. We follow. And what's already his, and what he's already taken is ours, because it's his, we just have to step into it. And guess what? There's going to be times where you're going to look out there, and it's going to look like people want to murder you. And it's going to look a little scary, right? And it's going to look not comfortable, okay? But if Jesus has already stepped there, and it's his, then he says he is giving it to us. And we just have to step into it. We just have to step into it. And I believe right here in the city of Akron, that's exactly what Jesus wants to do with us. And obviously he wants to do that in Mansfield. And obviously he wants to do that in Worcester. And obviously he wants to do that in Ohio. And obviously he wants to do that in, 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 in Europe. And then obviously he wants to do that to the ends of the earth. Acts 1-8, right? But we are talking about where Jesus has us. And it starts with us right here in that. And it's directly tied to our obedience. And so we follow. Okay, I thought that was a devotional. And that was a message. I'm sorry. I literally thought this one was going to be a devotional. And this is like half of what I had Sunday. And Sunday only talked 30 minutes. So I'm like, bro, this is 15 minutes. I'm up. But either way. So, um, you know, I want us to break down into groups and pray. But as you break down into your group and pray, I would like for you to talk about before you pray, real like it doesn't have to take a lot of time. But what's the thing that stood out to you the most in tonight's message? You know, um, let this sink in, guys. Um, remember, this is something that when I started, I said we're talking about that needs to be passed down, that it's wholesome, and if we're going to make an impact, this is what we should all be praying about. This is what we should all be talking about. Um, and, and really, this goes right along with the, with the book of Mark, because in the book of Mark, then Jesus shows up, and what's he doing all through the book of Mark? Fighting back darkness, man. He is, he is serving people and fighting back darkness, and, and so this goes right along with it. This is what Jesus um, is calling for us, man. And so let's praise him. Break down into groups. Pray. Talk about the things that stood out to you the most. I love you guys. Amen. Amen. Amen.